mindful of what I'm saying.
teaching, offering many more courses to us, sharing his knowledge for many years to come. Now take a moment and think of, of an effective action that you can perform to demonstrate your allegiance and loyalty to the teachings of Professor DeRose, whether it's bringing a new student to class or sharing some literature or information, a book about the Doros method with a friend or loved one. Now, open your eyes and let's finish our puja. Swastya. <laughs> it is not easy to put on a good show. Five, five. Four, three, two. We are on. Good evening for all those people who are at home tonight. We're starting a little bit late because I had a meeting that was unavoidable and it was very important and so everybody was warned and prepared for it so we would be a little bit later so do accept my apologies this is the reason that we are starting a little bit late so let us look at the themes for today meditation which is a really interesting theme it's a little bit lengthy let's see if i can fit it in this structure of the rose method i was this the topic of our very first class. I don't know if it's worth us uh, repeating it. Um, then we have choosing your professional path and balancing joy and income. We normally see a profession as something that is unpleasant. So like the karma class, of course we did karma. Most people understand it's something that is not so good, that you need to pay your karma, that you need to get rid of it. And this same culture Supposed, supposedly w means that work is an unpleasant thing. It has to be, it has to be tiring, humiliating. And for this reason, almost everyone loves Friday, as Saturday and Sunday are just about to arrive. Almost everyone hates the Monday because Oh, damn it, I'm going to have to go back to that horrid environment. This is a completely distorted view of what actually work is. Imagine if a bee hated working. 
or if an ant would be lazy at its functions. What happens is the human being in an ancient time invented an institution called slavery. And what we call work today of a job is a, an adaptation of slavery. A slave worked a lot. There was very little remuneration. If we consider a financial reward, well, but actually they had a home and they had food. Awful housing and even worse food, but they had some. And when they said to the worker that slavery has been abolished, everybody believed it. But it wasn't true. Slavery only changed in its format. Instead of a whip, today we have a communication, moral communication. Instead of earning just food and the right to, lead, to sleep in chains, today we have manipulated to think that things are better. <laughs> but if we manage to understand work not as a job and not as something that you do so that you must earn money not as an obligation but a pleasure our life is going to change completely our pleasure of living is going to change completely our motivation our pleasure to work what happens is people who have taught us who loved us very much wanted our well-being which was our family in general our parents our teachers our preachers they had a vision of the world which the only way of living is to be an employee. How many people are employers and how many are employees? By the natural laws of things, the employers are very few and the employees are very many. How many are generals and how many are soldiers? For natural law, there is a few generals commanding the different hierarchy and all of a sudden you have a huge amount of soldiers. Because of this, almost everyone is the son of an employer, employee. My son, my dad was an employee. It is likely that the, the father of most of you was an employee. And what can they teach us? What could my father teach me? He taught me to be an employee. It's what he knew. It was his universe. It was what he understood. And so if you're an employee, there is no joy. It is hard. You're working for another party. You are laboring for something that is not yours, for an ideal that is not yours. And when you look further ahead, what is waiting for you up ahead in the career? Except for a few, few exceptions, some careers that are available, some professionals that are really have it. But they constitute the minority, all of them. All the careers and that we know of. In general, what is expected of us up ahead? First, unemployment. Because everybody who is employed can become unemployed. Then, retirement. An employee normally sees it as a reward. I've been working, waiting for the reward of retirement so then I finally can enjoy life. 
but up ahead when you are retiring you have no youth left and so now you have all the time in the world but you have no more vigor no life no joy in life the joy of discovery of things one thing is to put a backpack on your back and go and travel in Paris, go in Europe, anywhere. Another thing is for you to retire, 60 odd. You've already known life, you already know the world. Would you want to do the same thing, backpacking? I don't know if your health would allow it. As a young boy, you would do that, in person, you would do that even trying to conquer some love, meet new people. At 60, I don't see the possibility of, or desire, or illusion of meeting some nice people. Many people don't even have given up trying to have relationships. And finally, in the largest majority of places in the world, there isn't a lot of perspective up ahead. And once I met a Swiss person in Rio, and he was crazy to come and live in Brazil. He was dying for it. I was still quite young. I hadn't traveled the world yet. I had no idea what the world was like, what Europe was like, what other countries were like. So I asked him, but you want to leave Switzerland where everything's working perfectly and come to Rio de Janeiro where nothing works. I mean, if you went to Sao Paulo, which is a little bit better where things work. And he said, no, 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 but I want this. I want to a place where I have no certainty what was going to happen tomorrow. Because in my country, he said, in Switzerland, when we are born, we already know everything that's going to happen in our entire lives. We already know which stud school we're going to study. We're going to know what career we're going to go follow. We know what age I'm going to be in college. And we're going to see, know what age I'm going to finish school. I know the job. I know the type of work. I, when I'm going to retire, it's so organized. This is hell. This takes away the joy in life. And I thought to myself, I don't think I quite agree with what you're saying. Things organized are nice. I like it. But... Maybe an exception. I met another gentleman, Swiss, Sweden, from Sweden, and he told me something very similar. And he added that at that time, so many years ago, if you live in a city with more than 5,000 people, five thousand people you start to pay a lot of taxes in other words people were stimulated to go and live in very small cities I don't think I'd like that but there are countries which are things are so well organized that if one side Things, there is people are haunted by the ghost of unemployment and, and the salaries are indecent and the treatment also of employees may not be very nice very pleasant from employers in these other countries things are so correct so perfectly that the employee is also without motivation in capitalistic countries, the entrepreneur has a motivation. They are stimulated. I'm going to start to sell hot dogs. But I have a motivation. I'm going to be the best hot dog of my neighborhood. I'm going to earn money with it. I'm going to improve. I'm going to improve my shop that I love. I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to travel. Maybe in Sweden, the person doesn't have the same stimulus. But in any way, the great problem of the person who works 
is not is working for somebody else's business somebody who's not an entrepreneur but who's an employee the joy of working is compromised greatly so the first work in this equation is between joy and earning money and joy of doing something it seems to me that the result, the best solution to this equation is to work in your own business. Oh, but I don't know how, I, I don't know how to do anything. I had a degree on this and I only know how to do this. I studied for that. I've loved that. This is what I know how to do. This is your illusion. All of us have potential latent talents which are amazing and normally they arise only when some upside down turns happens in our lives <laughs> when they're torn upside down we all have incredible talents which are uncorked in us and we can't even notice them There were no. F there were many authors. There were many, many from different time zones, from different centuries, who said the very same thing. In this century, it was put, and in a previous century, 20th century, it was put in a very simple way. If you want to win in life, if you want to have success, get an enemy because your enemy is going to be pushing you to making you jump forwards if you decide to work on that is work self-employed you are going to have these enemies they won't be few they're going to be your competitors and you're going to spend, you're going to be in situations which can be very difficult. You're going to be maybe without money, maybe you're going to be owing money to a bank. You're going to be in the risk of losing everything. This is fascinating. This makes you create solutions. And that you don't settle in. There is an image that we use a lot, very often, which is the soft pillow of inertia, which is your comfort zone. And it is based on this that in 1969 we created the theory of the syndrome of happiness when an individual is in this comfort zone and they don't need to fight or flight fight or flight when you don't need to fight or flight they stop to secrete stop secreting certain hormones and substances which are necessary for survival like any other animal we had to fight against our predators we had to fight for survival we had to fight them or flee and so when we survived there was and the feeling of euphoria of well-being some few years later in 71 if i'm not mistaken they discovered the endorphins before that they didn't nobody knew their existence but people felt it animals that they felt rewarded because they won that predator that battle that situation the predatory situation or in fight and won or won because they fled in just in time and won by running away 
the great problem is takes place when there's no stimulus. You don't need the challenge. You don't need to fight or flight for a long, for a lengthy period of time. As things stay too good for too long, you you fail to generate these substances. You fail to secrete them, and then you enter a situation in which this has already been said very often, studied in in labs, etc. The firstly, the person becomes exasperated. Then they give in. They give up. There's a movie, an ancient, an old movie, French movie, called that which he said, my uncle in America. The movie has nothing to do with the movie. The title has nothing to do with the movie. It's with Gérard Depardieu when he was very young. He was still quite thin. And the director, the film is very unpleasant, it's tiring, it's very monotonous. Typical art film, but it is important for us to get to know this mechanism. During filming, they compare all the time the human being with a little lab, right, lab rat. So they show a situation for a human and they compare that. How would a lab rat react in a similar situation? And so they show, for example, the little mouse in, in a cage, in an electrified cage. Something buzzes and a few year, minutes, seconds later, the charge is turned on. Scientists can be so sadistically cruel. Do you remember Pavlov? But this was the experience and sound goes off and electric current. The mouse would jump with a shock and be shocked and jumped and jumped and jumped. A few moments later, the researcher notices that if they turn the electric, if they ring the bell, ring the sound, first, first reaction was to sound the sound, and then the rat was ready, was ready to jump as he was ready for torture. And then a moment, a little bit later, imagine how long they did it for, for the poor mouse. You put, play the sound and the mouse is no longer moving. And they put on the current and the mouse doesn't move anymore. The researcher goes and checks what's going on. Is there a current? Yes, there is. But the mouse has given in, given up. And so they compare that with a human, an employee. And this little mouse which gave up, gave in, dies. And when they go and do another necrosis, an, an autopsy on it, they died with an enormous quantity of, use of gastric ulcers produced by the stress. Another experiment. They put the mouse together with others. When the, buzz, when the buzz is ringing, they're already conditioning, they, were, they know that they're going to be a shock. They start to fight each other. They don't die. First, before they die, they, they lose hunger, they lose their fur, they lose their sexual hunger, and then eventually they die. And then this other one fighting, they can release their stress, doesn't lose their fur, doesn't lose their hunger doesn't look the sexual drive and they don't die. Conclusion. Marriage is a good thing, right? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So there are many more other experiments. This is a lengthy film. In another scene, the human, it's always comparing between the human and the animals. In a situation in which we live in, something like that in our day to day, in a job, in a profession, in a career, and also in our affectionate relationships, our partners. In another scene, a, a government employee is betrayed by another and for a social obligation, etc. They have to have dinner together. His girlfriend goes with him and she is revolted with the situation. She's angry. How can you possibly go in and treat this gentleman well, this us? This person who snapped you in the back. No, no, dear, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he's torn between one thing and the other. And then suddenly, ah, uh, car to tech. And they compare that in the lab. A little mouse in a similar situation. But in all situations, professional in which the mouse were compared with humans, the human were in the position of an employee. In all situations, they were an employee. We've already seen here in a Karma course that practically every profession produces illnesses. There are very few that don't. I don't even know off by heart to be able to mention one that doesn't produce any illnesses. Because the professions, they don't motivate you generally. They're not very stimulating. Secondly, if you work sitting all day, then if you work somewhere where you have to be standing all day, you stay standing all day. And there are the professions that work lying down, but then you have to lie down all day. <laughs> the fact that you cannot vary physical positions when we were anthropods, when we were, we would stand, we would run, we would climb, we would go up in our trees. We would lie down, we would have a complete life moving the body, but then we created civilization. And now we have to pay the price for having done the stupidity. <laughs> and so, when we're working in a profession that demands that we are sitting down all the time, imagine here, in this most abnormal position, a natural position, it's bad for your back, it's good for your abdomen, it's good, bad for your internal organs, it's good for your breathing, it's bad for the knees, it is, it's bad for everything. In a recent study, it says that they're really awful even to go to the toilet. And for example, in a toilet, you, you squat, any animal squats, humans don't, they sit in a throne. The result is, even when you're excreting, we have to pay a price to be civilized. The Hindus and other people in Asia are right, where they have no seat and they squat. The very toilets are on the floor, just a hole. Was ceramic. The first time I went to India in 1975, I thought that was very peculiar because in our country, that would be a, a very, very, very poor person's toilet, which they have just a hole to squat on. But they are right, actually. Okay, the fact is, if we manage to escape from the format of having to work, to be employed, to be earn money, in other words, let's put it something else. If we have to work 
for money. That it's not a very beautiful phrase. Work for money. Then, if we don't work, you don't make. Therefore, you're not enjoying what you're doing. The good profession is which, even when not being paid, you're going to do. Money is going to be a consequence. So we can put an example. This example, typical example, the artists. This is not always true. They're going to paint. They're going to sculpt. Even if nobody buy their works, they simply can't help themselves. They're not being a sculptor for money. They don't. They're not a painter for money. Money is a consequence. Sometimes it comes. Other times, you can spend your entire life in selling only one painting. <laughs> but it is a profession in which, if you if you lock up a painter in a prison, true painter, they're going to paint with a little bit of 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 clay, a little bit of chow, coal, a little bit of brick, and they're going to be able to express the walls of his room, of his prison cell. And if he has no coal, no bricks, no nothing, they're going to paint with their own blood. They're going to find a way to extract their blood and paint. In our profession, we are like this. We do this, we do the... I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about all, all of us. We do this, all the people that work with the method, they work with passion, mission and passion together. If the first who started this work, the most experienced teachers and now have been with us for over 30, 40 years, there was a time when it really was difficult to make money this where we could make no money at all with this profession if we were going to do it by money for money we wouldn't be here today we'd have nothing built and so let's go back to that phrase that we started off on which was quite unpleasant working for money if you don't do your work unless you if you don't do your work unless people pay you to do it you're not in love with what you're doing See, for example, a musician, a saxophonist. They're going to pay regardless of being paid. If nobody's paying, they go to the streets, they go and play themselves next to the river. Because they love playing. And there's no weekend, there's no holiday, there's no weekend, there's nothing. A painter is going to paint all the time, a musician is going to play all the time. Weekends, holidays, all these were created for the people who were working with unpleasant things to the slaves. In my memory, my ancient memory, the first reference that I have of rest on the seventh day was resulting from slavery from the Hebrews in Egypt. They were slaves. They needed to rest. Today's slave also need to rest. But the entrepreneurs who are nobody's slave, no, they don't need to rest. They don't enjoy resting. And there is where you can unite and you can balance joy, happiness of working with your income. And you can balance it in a very interesting way because when you are working for pleasure, when you're working with joy, form joy, with motivation, you can do it so well that the reward, the income starts to come back and be increased. I remember an interview that I watched, by chance it was on TV. I was doing some exercise 
I was doing some, I was doing digital, <laughs> digital gym in front of the TV. And every man likes channel surfing. It's very interesting, there's something wrong with our architecture. The male likes to keep on clicking through channels. And I, I stopped at an interview and when the interviewer was saying, and what is the best profession for the young person? Which is the best person for a youth person to work? Oh, I work with this. I work with training individuals. I work with young people. I thought, oh, interesting. So I stopped. I want to know his answer. And the interviewer was called Emerson Capaz. I'll never forget his name again. <laughs> And he answered brilliantly. He said, the best profession for the youth today is for them to be able to do what they like. Because if they do it well, they're going to be a great professional. The best profession is what? The one that makes them happy. And everybody's going to compete to get the service of this person who enjoys it who's good, and they're going to be well rewarded, and they're going to be a virtuoso in what they do. The next question was also very interesting because the lady said, so what would be this suggestion? What is the best faculty to, to follow? And he said, there is none. There's no possibility to answer. Because a good profession today may not even exist any longer. When this person finishes university three, four, five years from now, maybe the profession no longer exists. And if it exists, it's probably already saturated. And this youth person coming out, oh, but it's such a good profession. This has a lot of potential. Four years later, it's sacrifice in vain investing in a university, in a profession. And so he said on the first one, so what do you have to do? When I started, I was 16, when I started teaching. It was scandalous. People wanted me to follow traditional professions back then. 56 years ago, over half a century ago. What were the traditional professions at that time? Engineering, doctors and lawyers. Maybe one or two another. If I wrote a book at that time as a lawyer or as an engineer or as a doctor, my book wouldn't be published because hundreds of other authors in these areas are already writing all the time about their specific fields of their own jobs, of their careers. But I wrote about something which was different. And I liked it so much, this experience, that we created a system so that we could, so that the person who really is, has a vocation to write, that they can have a whole structure that helps them to become a writer, that helps them to publish. Today we have, within our network, within our family, within our company, we have over 20 different writers, which in the large majority are young people, good writers. Okay, I think that's enough for this question. <laughs> okay. Okay, the future. Futurologists got almost everything wrong in their pre in their prescriptions, prescriptions, future prescriptions. <laughs> Do you remember when the computer was first created? Their creator said, "This has no use. It is just for people to have a little bit of fun." A few years later, 
Come on, this only the large companies are going to want. Nobody ever imagined that computers could be so prevalent. It could be in your wrist or in your pocket or each and every one of us as a smartphone, as a watch. Even if you go further back in Metropolis, 84, 1984, Orwell, who previewed that we would have the computer? Nobody even imagined it. And so, whatever preview, I'm, uh, whatever future vision I'm having is going to be wrong. It's going to be a fantasy. But, for me, I have a supposition based on the things that have been happening in the past. Okay, so the first great probability is that as I die, as the systematizer dies, everything transforms in a way that is biased. This is a great probability. The second probability that a one Roman person appears, a gentleman named Saulo, who never met me, who never knew me, and who turns this the biggest success in marketing in the global world. Do you remember the story? The Roman called Saulo, who persecuted Christianity, one day had a vision of something, and from there he was the, the Saint Paul, who was a structure of Christianity. He formatted Christianity and he had never met Christ. So if he did it right or wrong, it doesn't, um, I can't judge. <laughs> there are so many variables, it's very difficult to imagine. Another which I imagine could take place, it's possible, came to me to a dream. It, it was a dream. I was asleep and I dream, dreamt about it. There's nothing crazy about this. I dreamt that 50 years from now, bless you, there will be two groups antagonical to with each other. The De Rosists and the De Rosians. <laughs> Enemies amongst each other. Both saying that they were doing that exactly to defend and protect the cultural heritage of the Rose. The De Rosists were very professional. And they would say that the others were mystical, they were visionaries, they were loonies. <laughs> the Derosians would say they were more philosophical, dedicated. And they would say that the Derosists were mercantilists, capitalists. And they would fight amongst each other, each one defending the very same thing. I hope this doesn't take place. If it does, I've already denounced it up, up here. <laughs> but what I've been trying to do, with including with the help of Bruno here, was, is to try to put a, a legislative structure that stops that that stops that it's inherited or succeeded, takes this away from you. And then that the more experienced teacher, the more dedicated teachers, the more with the, the people who have the most accomplished within this method can determine the, the, the designations for the name of the brand of this method. That's why today we have a collegiate of presidents of federations, which each country has their own federation. And so 
each state has their federation in some places and the presidents of the federation form a collegiate together with their vice presidents. There are three vice presidents in each federation. So there's one president, three vice presidents for each federation and that the more experienced ones clearly, the most dedicated ones. This is one of the powers, the collegiate. And then on the other side, we have the board of administration, the board of directors, where the directors of different schools, which are certified. These are younger, normally. Normally, the presidents are a little bit older, and the people in the board of directors are a little bit younger. And so this group has combative ideas and strong ideas, they are warrior-like. And the others have the experience of life and say, calm down, it's not exactly like this. So they hopefully balance each other. And above both, there is a central directorate. The central directorate is basically formed by a three parts. And now we are finding a way to the collegiate and the board can, can be considered members of this power. So they can elect whomever it is, one of these three falls. Uh, I've actually rewrote the statute, Bruno, for the directorate. So I'm going to show it to you again. I think it's good now. I need uh, eyes that are experienced in the law to look at this. So, for what I see in the future, that's, that's what I see. I can see one more thing. I can see that. I am on the way of the method. When I, I am seeing the... <laughs> when I'm pushing me up daisies. <laughs> the method probably is going to go much more quickly, it's going to grow much more quickly because as it was me who created it, this thing, <laughs> obviously there is a little bit of, of, of people who are opposing and people who are jealous and envious, people who started more or less in the same way or more or less in the same topic couldn't achieve what I did. They got nowhere. And these people are very jealous and envious and angry with me. They have a lot of hatred. Not so beautiful, but they have it. If I am no longer here, probably they're going to fight a lot less with you guys. And I can also see this. And at the time that I'm no longer here, this is going to explode. Because if I live, and we already are all over the Americas, and all over Western Europe, if I am no longer here, the thing can explode much further. The only matter is, 20 years ago, more or less, be a little less, our directors, most experienced directors, called something up, they, they took something. We were growing too quick. And these directors, which later on came to put together the board and the collegiate, they, these more experienced individuals alerted us. They alerted the other instructors for the undeniable fact that when something grows, it loses its quality. And we were in a very powerful growth moment, in a dangerous growth moment. And so they created, I thought this was incredible because it was a, a consciousness by the very teachers themselves, they created a culture of total quality and zero tolerance for mistakes. They created it. And they managed to revert the trend, which was a general rule, which is the more something grows, the more quantity, the quality lowers. 
And in our case, this was exactly the opposite. They've managed, we've managed to have it the way that we increase the quantity, the quality was also increasing together. This was sensational. I had never seen this happen before. We had never had so much quality, spontaneous, generated by the very teachers themselves. The maturity of individuals, the stability, the dedication to the profession, the professionalism of themselves, generated by themselves. This was amazing. And the future, maybe, has something to do with that. Okay. What time do we need to finish? Don't, don't look at me. Whenever you want. <laughs> when do we finish? Okay, I finish at 10 and then I'm going to carry on without cameras, okay? The translation doesn't stop, just the cameras. I like punctuality. I really love punctuality. And regrettably, because of my other commitments, oftentimes I find it difficult to stay perfectly punctual. But I think it's one of the fundamental qualities in a human being. So, if I cannot start at the right time, at least I'm going to close in the right time. Even if it is just pro forma and for the cameras. And so, people at home, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you... This is the end for you guys. And I'm going to carry on here a little bit longer, maybe an hour, maybe more. For my watch, I've got a minute to go. <laughs> this is a great trip to New York, wasn't it? It was excellent. It was very productive. You that are at home, you have no idea what happened here. Today, I compared my the guys here working some were working we were working in my apartment and others in other places but these guys in my apartment they were working with the projects with translations with publications and john was on the phone and camila was doing the cover of another book at their school and i looked at it and said this feeling that i have from this is that I have a little bunch of worker bees working away, working enthused. And this feeling is the one that I get, John. This is the feeling I get. Our people is, com, can be congratulated. Nobody lost time and we are doing so much stuff. One teaching, another doing just lots of different things. This was fascinating, fascinating to me. A hive <laughs> in full swing. And I'm really, really happy, super satisfied. I've, I stayed a month away and from you guys in Brazil, but clearly I lamented because I lost a bunch of events and solemnities and I even wasn't able to be present to, to receive a medal, but so many other things happened here. In Sao Paulo, things are happening all the time. It's a rhythm that I can say that it is more intense than the rhythm of New York City. But I enjoyed it. We could bring that egregor here. And we had a good progress. Now I hope that the ones that are staying here can maintain this rhythm. Because we cannot get accommodated. And please don't lie down in the soft cushion of inertia. <laughs> Tim helped us immensely. Everybody helped. Tim, Marisol, Tessari, Rob, Vivi, Nuno, Fe, Livia, <laughs> John, where even John did something. Camila did lots. <laughs> a little bit of, a little troop, a little military regiment. And the others who are working here, my translation, translator Fabs, never shuts up. <laughs> Rick, working at the school, keeping things up. 
these we didn't see. And they're working silent. Well, not so silent, maybe. <laughs> I did great, I had great in contacts in Rotary, I had others in my contact today, it was a very fruitful trip. And now we have André here, who came from Brazil to stay, to be integrating this troop. <laughs> this New York military front, on the people's front of the rose. <laughs> And there we're having more people who are ready to come to the U.S. Especially when our school in San Diego and our school in L.A. start soon. So people who live in France, Italy and Spain and Argentina and Chile and in Brazil, now keep your ears up because we have these two new schools set to get started. And they're two amazing cities. We need team there. Okay, guys. Okay, enough. Thank you. Swastia.